my name is Janet Bush. I'm a senior editor with the McKinsey Global Institute, which is the economics and business research arm of McKinsey and Company. So we're going to spend today um, walking you through um, some of the key findings of our new research on the bio revolution. Um, and with us today, we have two of the lead authors, um, Michael Chewy, um, who's based in San Francisco and is a partner with MGI, and Matthias Evers, who's in Hamburg and is a senior partner with the firm uh, in charge of R&D in the pharmaceuticals and medical production uh, products practice. Matthias, um, can I hand over to you to start walking our guests through the findings? Why did, why did we look at this research in the first place? Yeah, I mean, thank you, thank you, Janet. Um, let me first actually start by saying uh, that I feel humbled with this audience here today. It's really an honor to introduce our findings to you. But, um, I mean, we got interested roughly one year ago about the progress of biology more broadly. So it's really worth maybe starting, why did we actually get interested? Because somebody might say, what about in the year 2000? Because there was a moment when the draft human genome was presented, coming out of a, what is inflation and just the $5 billion project. And why not there? Why now? So we looked at um, the environment and first, first, we see significant progress in our understanding of biology. So these are advances that make bioengineering very real. One example that you see here depicted also the CRISPR-Cas9 genome editing technology is for sure groundbreaking because it allows us very specifically to edit the, the human genome. This was, uh, of course, researched a bit earlier, but latest uh, in 2013 was a groundbreaking publication. It was understood the power of CRISPR-Cas9 in genome editing. There's, of course, way more on the biology side. One example are the CAR T cell therapies, where you can actually um, weaponize and program your own T cells. Or the Human uh, Cell Atlas project, where some, of, uh, some people describe it as the Google Maps of actually the human body. Now, that's one side of the coin. If we look at the other side of the coin, if I could have the next slide, We see a lot of progress on computing, data handling, AI, and automation that makes now a big difference in the progress of biology. So Michael, my colleague, will sp later speak about sequencing. I just give you my, my, my own example, which some might feel is very boring. Yeah? I, I want to focus for a second on data storage. As a human genome, we speak about 2.9 billion, 2 .9 billion base pairs. And it's rough cut 725 megabyte. Let's say one gigabyte with some additional storage, et cetera. One gigabyte in 2000, the time I was in bioinformatics in the lab, costed you something like $17. Doesn't sound so expensive. But if you now buy this for 0 0.004 cent in the cloud, we speak about an innovation factor of more than 4,000. So there's an innovation force that allows actually biomedical progress. Another one is the automation, how it's driving, um, for instance, I mean, how to utilize pluripotent stem cells, iPSCs, that many of you will know, at scale in labs and allowing much faster drug discovery. Now, if I move to the next slide. Our thesis for this research was that there's a confluence of these forces. So basically, better understanding of biology, progress in biological technologies, but also computation, data handling, AI, and automation. So our research question was really, is this conference so strong that biology becomes an innovation force, not dissimilar to digital? As you can hear from our excitement, and you have seen the report, of course, already, and we started this research. We believe that the digital revolution is, and bio revolution is around us. And we answered a few questions here. Number one, is this only in pharma and in agro, or is this cutting across industry? How broad is it? How deep does it go? So that's really what we want to present here today. Any quick words? I mean, Jen, my colleague Bennett said already, it's a special time. We, of course, live in COVID, and this work started a year ago. It was not on the horizon at all. We just hear it's still worth to talk about it because this environment shows the big upside of biology and we see the vaccines race to find the therapeutic 
or find a therapeutic against COVID, that shows the power of the methodologies and the upside and actually the necessity for innovation and technology. But it, of course, also shows the threat. Now, of course, this is a naturally uh, occurring virus, but what about uh, experiments in some garage somewhere and the risk of it? Matthias, as you were saying, that this, uh, you know, the COVID-19 uh, crisis, and in some cases a tragedy, really has reminded us of the power of biology, you know, not only in health, but across the entire economy. In that case, negative, but uh, I think what our report shows is there are tremendous positives as well. When we looked at the research, though, one of the things we really had to do is, is define the problem. What is the scope of things that we wanted to look at? Um, and we found basically four arenas that we thought were important for us to dig into. Uh, one is around biomolecules, and um, you know, if you think about DNA, RNA, things at the molecular level, um, you know, whether it's sequencing or CRISPR-Cas9, as Matthias was talking about, real advances are happening there. Uh, and so, you know, one example is gene therapies for monogenic diseases. Again, we looked at many, many different potential use cases. Secondly, if you level up to biosystems, this is when you get to the cellular level, or even you know, higher than cellular level, entire organisms. Um, and in this case. We also see uh, lots of things, uh, lots of innovations happening. Um, you know, we'll come back to this later, but this idea of you know, cultured meat, the idea that you could actually grow meat in the laboratory. Um, third domain is biomachine interfaces. Um, now we're increasingly finding the ability to connect very much more directly. Uh, you know, the, the old realm of IT, not that old, but you know, older realm of IT, with biology, and so whether or not this is, you know, neuroprosthetic interfaces, other ways to connect the brain more directly to computers. And finally, the potential for using biology as a computational substrate, uh, either for computation or particularly for storage, which we think uh, is more likely to happen earlier. So those are, the, that's the realm, the, the arenas that we looked at. Um, let me just quickly, uh, if we go to the next slide, describe a, just a, a quick preview of the things we'll talk about uh, here. And again, we invite your questions, as Janet said, uh, through the Q&A. Uh, firstly, you know, what we understood and through our research established that in fact, the pace of the, the uh, technical innovations really is accelerating. We really think we're reaching an inflection point, not only in the science and engineering, but the pace at which things get from laboratory to market. So that's why we really think that we're, we're really at a point where People need to pay attention to this uh, in a way perhaps that they hadn't, um, uh, particularly across the entire economy. Um, secondly, these technical and scientific and engineering innovations really create new fundamental capabilities for companies, for organizations, um, and, and that, that changes the game in terms of the way that, that their businesses will run, the way that supply chains will be constructed, um, you know, the way that competition will occur. Thirdly, the incredible breadth of this revolution. It is no longer just about you know, healthcare or, or agriculture. We really do believe that this, uh, these uh, innovations will span across, uh, the impact of these innovations will span across the entire economy. Um, we actually you know, took what we describe at MGI as a micro to macro approach. We didn't just sort of look at things at a top level. Uh, we in fact looked at over 400 different individual use cases of the potential uh, for a biorevolution. And we know that's not exhaustive either, but it's a pretty large number. Uh, and we have some interesting uh, findings from, from that depth of research. Um, there are unique risks. I mean, Tia's made reference to it. We'll, we'll cover some of those as well. Some of them are echoes of, of previous risks we've seen in digital. Some of them are, are quite unique to this domain. Uh, and then finally, there, you know, th these things actually don't happen overnight. Um, I think a lot of these uh, innovations we might have heard of, they might have you know, shown up in, uh, in a publication or other. Um, what we try to do is understand seriously what it takes to get from lab uh, into the marketplace. Uh, and so we're going to, to describe some of the findings there. And so we go to the next page. and just want to illustrate you know, the first point, which is the, the pace at which some of these um, technologies are developing. Let's take gene sequencing, for instance, the ability to, to decode the, the list of nucleic acids um, in, a, in DNA and RNA, for instance. Uh, when it was first done for humans, the Human Genome Project, um, it took uh, 13 years. Um, you know, that, it was actually done ahead of time. They had budgeted 15 years, and it took about $2.7 billion or $3 billion. Um, now it's under 1000 uh, bucks, and within not a long time, it'll be less than $100 to sequence a, a full, full sequence of a human genome. And, uh, you know, my background is in IT, and, and, you know, you think about all 
all of the amazing things that Moore's Law has allowed us to do. This is the fact that for the same dollar amount, um, you need to buy twice as much computing every 12, 18 months or so. Um, what we're finding is technologies like sequencing are actually advancing faster than Moore's Law. And a part of that is underwritten by these uh, achievements in IT. But then if you think about all the things that happened in IT because of you know, Moore's Law, and you think about a set of technologies which are advancing faster, do we think that potentially you know, these uh, underlying technologies could create really disruptive change? We actually do. And so if you, we go to the next page and describe a few of these um, new fundamental capabilities which we think these scientific uh, um, advancements and innovations can unlock. First, creating new ways of producing, um, you know, producing materials, for instance. Um, you know, there's an example that, that we talk about uh, in the report uh, and in one of our videos, actually. There's a, a, a cosmetic um, ingredient uh, called squalene, which, you know, the traditional method of production was harvesting you know, deep sea sharks and using their livers. Um, that's both not very economic as well as, you know, not great for the environment. Um, now, you know, by uh, uh, modifying uh, the, the genes of, of yeast we, through fermentation, uh, the, it's possible to actually create, um, you know, both more reliably as well as more economically and a higher quality, uh, a very similar kind of product. And so, again, you see changes in the potential of our ability to produce things. Secondly, our ability to target actions, to be, you know, people have heard about the term precision medicine or precision agriculture. Uh, again, you can think about the fact that, you know, now, you know, we can treat a cancer based on the, on the specific tumor within a patient. Again, that's changing the way that we think about medicine and, and, and these carry over in other places as well. And we also have the ability to reprogram organisms, right? If you think about the genetic code as being like a computer code, and now we can use techniques like CRISPR-Cas9 to reprogram those organisms, we can actually change the way that they operate in the world. Let's say, take, for example, you know, again, there, there are risks associated with it, but the idea of using a technique called gene drives in order to modify mosquitoes and reduce the incidence of malaria. Uh, that's a potential that's out there as well, so reprogramming life. Fourthly, uh, higher R&D productivity. There are a, a number of places in the world where either productivity has slowed in some cases, uh, the growth in productivity has certainly slowed in, in, in many parts of the economy. And what we see is this convergence, this convergence of artificial intelligence, automation, and biology, uh, in some cases to increase the throughput of, uh, of uh, biological, particularly R&D, uh, by many times. And I think we'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, and then finally, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, these are two realms, IT and biology, which are increasingly coming together, um, both in terms of the techniques, but literally together. For example, those, you know, neural machine interfaces that I talked about uh, a moment ago. So if we go, go, go to the next slide, um, we'd love to open it up for questions. Uh, hopefully we've received some through the chat, uh, but Janet, uh, leave it to you to, to moderate. Yes, um, the, the questions have started to come in. Thank you so much to everybody. Um, I guess the first one, um, maybe Michael, with your background in IT, this one's for you. Um, what is the role of AI in this biological revolution? I, I, yeah, I, I actually do have a, a, a background in artificial intelligence, um, but I grew up in a medical family, so it's sort of fun to see these things uh, coming together. Um, and so, I, I, you know, one of the things that, that these technologies in biology have created is huge amounts of data. Again, if you, you sequence a human genome, you know, as, as Matthias said, you know, so many base pairs. Uh, that generates huge amounts of data. Now, if you think about having the genome of many, many different people and then trying to associate that with their electronic medical health records and then try to extract from their interesting uh, findings, you know, people talk about genome-wide association studies, right? And that's a technique that's out there. Many of you might have heard of those before. It's actually not possible to do that without all of the innovations that we have in data. And if you think about artificial intelligence as a way of extracting useful insights and patterns from data, that's precisely the types of techniques which can be used to, to actually make good use of all of this biological data, which is exploding at exponential rates. But Michael, let me add to that, because this is a fundamental question, I think, also underpinning our entire research. So, so obviously, it's amounts of data. But here's something more. I mean, so humanity almost in science has taken a reductionist approach. And I take something close to my heart, which is more in the, in the pharmaceutical healthcare space. 
So there's a disease, and then we believe there's this one assay that tells us about the disease, and then there's this one molecule that makes that difference in this one disease, so very reductionist. Biology is everything else than reductionist. And biology is complex, multimodal, and it's actually beyond the human that to understand the complexity of all the factors. So the approach of AI is actually the only tool to handle and to understand biology. And we are perhaps at the beginning to really deploy that, to really learn from it. But that's why this conference is, is, is so powerful as we describe it. But let me maybe not drag on, and Janet, maybe we have another question here. Um, well, yes, I like this one because um, it, 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 I don't know what the answer is going to be. Um, so I'll ask it to both of you. Um, what surprised you the most um, about this research? Um, Michael, first. Well, I, I, I think it, one thing that's always surprising is whether or not you thought it before, you know, actually having it, um, you know, come to, to life in the research. Really the breadth and the depth of the potential impact, I think, is one of the things that, uh, that really hit me, at, you know, as I look back at it. You know, 400 different individual use cases truly expanding across the entire economy. I think that's remarkable. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to steal Matthias the thunder. He's going to mention a few of the, the, um, the measures of, of scale that, that we, we discovered as we came through in the, in the next section, uh, but really remarkable in terms of the percentage of you know, physical materials which potentially could be uh, produced through bioroutes. Uh, it was astounding to me. Um, so, so, Matthias, I know that you're going to talk about the scope of this revolution um, after this, but could, could you just say what surprised you the most, um, and then let's um, crack on with uh, some more slides. Yeah, why don't I say two things? I mean, one is, and I'm very honest here, it was a relief. Because we had this very strong feeling, now is the time for something that we can call and claim as a bio-revolution. And as Michael said, the breadth and depth of impact, actually more tells us a revolution is already here. And especially also outside the core sectors of agro and pharma, there's a lot to be found in terms of visible innovation pipeline. But why don't I take that as a, as a signal to crack on and we come, come back to some of the questions I see here. I want to talk about it, but that we do maybe a little bit later. So because, Michael said, surprising are really these, these few key, key figures. And one figure that we have been uh, iterating on is 60% of the physical inputs to the global economy could be produced using biological means. Um, I won't dwell into the fine print of this, but just to explain the number a little bit. 20% of direct inputs are from um, biological materials, wood, paper, agricultural products, and you can imagine how that's impacted. The other 40% are actually interesting. How can, by the means of modifying microbes, fermentation, et cetera, how can you actually produce bio-based materials that have, I mean, there are many examples we talk in our report about, um, I mean, different kind of properties, better properties, but are bio-related. So this is a, a, a very surprising big figure. If you move to the next slide. Now, we went also a little bit in, into, into healthcare, and we did a bottom-up model. So we basically looked at what is the unmet need based on daily. So the people out of that sector know that the and daily adjusted life here. So a measure for, for an unmet need. And then we took a, a view at the visible innovation pipeline, be it um, cell and gene therapies in the pipeline, new medications, et cetera. And our estimate is that based on bio-based uh, innovations, we can tackle 45% of the unmet need. So that is in it, in, in, indeed a very encouraging figure, as we also live in special times. So this, I mean, we see it live every day, how people are racing to find a COVID therapeutic. But this also could be guiding where's the remaining unmet need in future. But again, uh, quite a surprising figure. If you move on. So this is a little bit more on the how things are being done. And what we did here is we looked a, a bit into uh, the different types of R&D and looked at the total global R&D spend and the types of R&D that can be clearly impacted uh, um, by bio-related technologies, bio-related efforts. 
20% of the global R&D sits in healthcare, so that's easy to explain. And then we found at least 5% in industries, 5% food, paper, chemicals, and others. So that constitutes a bit the 30%. If we move on. Now, this is something that really, I mean, perhaps I should have said that is a little bit surprising because um, people see my background, and yes, I was of course expecting there's a lot in terms of impact in agro, in healthcare, etc. But I think these numbers are also staggering in terms of greenhouse emissions because, I mean, if you really dig into it and, and say, for instance, the bio routes to, to generate fabrics and dyes as one specific example. So, um, I mean, of course, we can dig further into the details that are documented in our report, but this is really an, an impact of how more bio in the industries can actually impact also to our, have an impact on our, our surroundings. Now, these are some of our hopefully interesting figures, as you feel it. Now, behind that is also a bottom-up um, approach to look into each domain. Michael, why don't I ask you to present and go there a little bit? Happy to. So, you know, as we talked about before, we looked at hundreds of different potential individual use cases. As Matthias made reference to, many of them are in places that you probably would have expected. So if you talk about human health and performance, again, you know, there's a huge long history in pharmacal and, 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 and pharma and medical products of creating real innovations um, that either extend life or improve the quality of life. Uh, we see these, this sets of biological technologies in this bio-revolution um, continuing and accelerating that trend. And so whether it's the ability to cure with a single treatment, um, you know, what otherwise would have been lifelong diseases, uh, you know, some blood diseases, thalassemia, uh, sickle cell, for instance, uh, these monogenic diseases uh, that are the result of a mutation in a single gene, um, now we're seeing treatments where literally with a single treatment, uh, a patient can be cured for their entire life. That's incredible, certainly incredible for the patient, but then uh, perhaps challenging uh, for, um, you know, certain healthcare uh, and, um, you know, business models. But that all said, if you, you know, sum all those up, the net of the, the impact within, you know, a decade or two um, could literally be in, in, in a trillion dollar range. And by impact, we mean not only, um, you know, profits, uh, you know, for providers uh, and, and um, you know, and, and of, of pharmaceuticals as well as medical services, uh, but indeed the, the benefits that patients and people get uh, from not getting sick or living longer. So that's amazing. But again, that's something that you might have expected. Many of these biological innovations come from, you know, medicine, et cetera. Uh, but if we flip to the next slide, what we actually discovered, there are a set of other domains, you know, where the impact is both substantial and quite direct. Um, again, in agriculture, um, you know, the ability, for instance, uh, to be able to um, use these techniques in order to increase the yield um, of, of, uh, of, of plants that we use that, um, you know, in agriculture um, to improve the drought resistance, um, to even increase the nutritional value of those. Um, so those are ways in which these techniques can improve the existing agricultural supply chain. Um, but that said, there are now competitors to the existing, uh, uh, to the existing agricultural supply chain. If you think about the meat production uh, supply chain, for instance, we do see other protein competitors, some of them plant-based. Uh, and then, as I mentioned before, the ability to, you know, create cultured meat. Uh, a number of different players are creating, you know, what now is lab-grown meat using meat cells. Now, currently, those are very expensive and not cost competitive. If we look forward a decade, it is quite possible that, in fact, some of these cultured meat products will be cost competitive with traditional ways of agriculture, um, you know, producing those. One of the questions we've received is, you know, what are the things that have to happen? At the end of the day, to a certain extent, this is about engineering. Uh, it is the process of how can you scale up this process from creating a few grams uh, to literally creating kilograms and kilograms of, of these. Uh, and it is, it is about engineering and achieving scale. But also in consumer, um, you know, consumer products, uh, you know, whether it's cosmetics, as I mentioned before, or even the ability to use the understanding from um, sequencing, uh, just use the data itself without having to use CRISPR-Cas9 and modifying life. Uh, you could potentially target everything from your microbiome, the, the, the microbes in your gut, uh, to your diet. Uh, and so we're looking at a, a lot of those potentials as well, as I said before, in the idea of personalization or, or precision targeting. And then also materials, uh, chemicals, energy. 
And she has mentioned that, you know, rather startling statistic about the, you know, the 60% of the physical inputs to the economy have the potential to be produced through bioroutes. That could affect everything from the production of textiles uh, to fuels. And so if you sum all of those up, you know, again, within the you know, 10 to 10, 20 year time frame, we could be looking at several trillion dollars, two to four trillion dollars of direct economic impact. By the way, that's only in the 400 use cases. That doesn't include ones that, you know, we didn't come up with. And furthermore, and I think, you know, there are some questions here about, you know, is there a sector that this doesn't affect? We don't think so because, again, you know, that, that's all about the direct effects. There are downstream effects as well as upstream effects of each of these. Upstream effects, it will change the supply chain of everyone who, you know, both feeds into industries that are affected by the biorevolution or have to compete with them. And then finally, these have downstream impacts. Second and third order bounces the ball, to mix a metaphor. Again, if you're in the life insurance business and some of these health and human performance uh, levers actually change lifespans, that's going to change a number of your, you know, actuarial assumptions. So with that, if we go on to the next page, while we recognize huge potential benefits here, uh, it is true that there are real risks uh, that have to be managed. As I mentioned before, some of them rhyme with some of the, the challenges that we've seen in digital, some of the risks that we've seen in digital. Take privacy, for instance. Uh, we worry about these, you know, this breadcrumbs a trail that we leave through the Internet with using our phones. Um, now you think about, you know, what's more personal than, in fact, your genetic makeup? Uh, and if someone were to have access to that, what would they be able to do? Or, for example, in the idea of, you know, neuromachine interfaces, if you can, in quotes, read someone's thoughts, you know, what does that mean for privacy? So there's a set of challenges there which, are, you know, in, in some ways are an echo of some of the challenges that we've seen in digital. And then we see some of these risks which are more unique to biological. I'm, obviously, they're computer viruses. Uh, but, you know, some of these characteristics of biology, uh, it is self-replicating. Uh, life finds a way, many people have said, for instance. Uh, it doesn't really respect national borders. You know, if a, if a seed goes from or, or genetically modified insects flies across a border, um, it's not really going to matter whether or not the laws in the first uh, country, you know, matter and the laws, you know, are different than the laws in the second country. That biology will continue to move. There, biology is incredibly interconnected. Um, you know, you change something out in the wild and it might actually cascade through to an entire ecosystem, right? So you could think about, you know, the butterfly's wings types of uh, metaphors or Pandora's box being opened. And to that matter, I mean, one of the amazing things about, you know, the decrease in cost is the increasing accessibility of these technologies. Literally, you have people who are ordering CRISPR kits on the Internet and, you know, hacking their own bodies in their garage. In some ways, that's amazing. Uh, that means that anyone, you know, from Bangkok to Belgium can contribute to the innovations in biology. At the same time, that also means, you know, if someone does something that has an unintended consequence or someone who's, you know, a bad actor decides to misuse these technologies, these are real challenges as well. And so all of these risks have to be taken into account hopefully in a fact-based, thoughtful, inclusive way in order to decide what are the things that we actually want to do with these technologies? How do we make sure we capture all the benefits that we possibly can while managing and mitigating some of these risks? So with that said, we go to the next slide. Uh, you know, we'd love to talk about just a couple other things. First of all, we did really try to understand time. Understand time frames, um, uh, take time very seriously. What does it take to get from the lab to the market? Because that just doesn't happen overnight. You know, we see these, you know, preprints, uh, you know, on MedArchive, et cetera, and you say, wow, that's amazing, right? And now we've solved the problem. And the answer is not quite yet. First of all, you do have to get the science, right? And that means you do have to invest. You need to have talent. You need to have, you know, all of the scientific uh, funding, um, you know, data, et cetera, to, to actually solve the problem. But once you solve it in the lab, there are a bunch of other things that have to happen before it can hit, hit the market. You do have to have a value proposition. We've seen some challenges with previous iterations of biological innovation, say biofuels, for instance, which had a cost competitiveness issue with the, with the alternatives that already existed in the market. You have to have a business model. Uh, I mentioned before, you know, how do you think about things when a disease, when you can, you know, cure it with a single treatment? How do you think about that? In fact, getting to market, there's a, you know, marketing funnel or, you know, as, as we now talk about, you know, customer journeys, 
how are people aware of it? How do they, you know, become convinced of its business or, or, or you know, its value, whether it's a business value or a health value, et cetera, and then actually, you know, choose, choose to buy it or have, you know, someone choose to pay for it? Uh, and then actually scaling up, I mentioned this a little bit before about lab-grown meat, but this is true about many, many different bio, bio routes. It's one thing to create biological um, materials at a, at a lab capability. It's a very much different thing to try to create, you know, thousands of kilograms of it in a giant reactor where, you know, the conditions at the bottom of the reactor might be very different than the conditions at the top of the vessel. And so there's a lot of real engineering that has to go into it. And then, as I mentioned before, through this entire process, you need to be considering the risks, um, understanding what the regulatory impacts might be. You know, what, one thing that we looked at was, you know, even given existing regulatory regimes, about 70% of the innovations uh, that we think are possible already, you know, fall within some existing regulatory regimes. And so understanding, you know, both how society as well as, you know, um, you know regulators and, and, and governments will react is an important part. If you think about all of those, um, if we go to the next slide, we just did try to, to you know, place, again, not with great precision, but with some idea of which types of innovations are really in the very short term, in the next, you know, from now through the next decade. We're already seeing CAR-T therapies, for instance, um, as, as a way to go after um, you know, uh, cancer, for instance, plant based proteins are in the market, uh, growing very fast over a small base. Um, you know, so we see some of these innovations uh, that are already literally in the market today and growing quickly. We see some that are probably a decade or more off. Um, you know, whether it's cultured meat, as I mentioned, you know, again, perhaps within a decade, uh, cost competitive, but when you look at where the actual kink in adoption might be, that, 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 that point of acceleration and adoption. It might be, um, you know, a, a decade out, for instance. And then some things that are really farther and longer term. You know, we do know that you could potentially use stem cells to grow a new organ, you know, maybe using 3D printing to create a substrate or what have you. Uh, but we do think that that's farther off, and there are a number of reasons why that's true. But certainly, this, you know, getting the science right, as I said in the previous chart, is important. And then getting it to market takes a lot, lot more. And so with all that said, if we go to the next page, just talk, you know, quite briefly about some of the ways in which this could impact, you know, your companies, your organizations uh, as leaders out there. First of all, there are a set of business models which really are biology first. Um, we do see new competitors uh, who are specializing in using these technologies, the biological technologies, as well as the automation, artificial intelligence, et cetera. For instance, to create platforms, understand at a broad base you know, what the data is, what you could actually do using all of these different technologies. Secondly, there's a, you know, a new level of personalization. We've seen personalization before in digital. Now you can really personalize uh, or be precision uh, with regard to individuals um, as a result of understanding of these. Um, you know, not only someone's genome, but, you know, as many people have noted, there's more genetic material in your microbiome and the organisms that live in and on your body than you do have in yourself as a person. So there's lots more work to be done there. Value chains, indeed, will be disrupted. I talked about, for example, the meat value chain, if you think about agriculture. But again, if you think about textiles, you know, you can now grow, you know, produce spider silk as a potential textile. Uh, that's changing the way that uh, you might think about where materials come from. There is a confluence of disciplines. So what is the talent that you need? Um, you know, I had the opportunity to uh, uh, interview Jennifer Doudna, the co-inventor of CRISPR recently. Um, you know, I asked her, you know, what, what should people study uh, if they go to college expecting an answer about biology? And she actually said, you know, machine learning, artificial intelligence, those sorts of things, for exactly the reasons that Matthias mentioned. Uh, they are so integral to actually accomplishing biology nowadays. And then finally, you know, we talked a little bit about risks, um, really understanding, you know, how society will accept or not accept these technologies, what regulators will require, how that will play out over time, incredibly important given the way that, the, that these technologies evolve and the impact that they might have. And with that, why don't, uh, Janet, why don't you um, lead us through some questions and Yes, yeah, well, we thank you very much, Michael. Um, let me just go to the first one. I think um, uh, one of the um, questions is, um, why do some people consider bio, bio, bio as a threat rather than an opportunity? I, mean, I think we touched on risks, but um, Matthias, do you want to say a bit more about that? Yeah, I'm very happy to. Now, 
Um, you might say I'm, an, uh, I, I'm a German, but I'm still an optimist and I'm a scientist, so I should be very op optimistic about it. Yeah. Still, I mean, I think, as, as you know from the research, I've been coining this term Pandora's box is open. So I do feel that uh, biology is, is democratizing in a way because tools like CRISPR, gene editing, are very affordable. So I saw also this question, are big investments needed? Now, to scale up manufacturing, of course, I'm not diminishing that big investments are needed. But to make progress on the research side, I mean, actually, it's very cheap and accessible. Now, I, I'm, I won't go into the area of somebody willfully doing uh, something wrong, I mean, bioterrorism. But even in terms of experiments that are not fully controlled and lead to to, to harmful substances that are replicated. I think that's a big risk. So the, the question is really, what is the right balance of allowing innovation, but also finding a framework? And that is not that dissimilar to, let's say, to AI. I mean, risks are also not fully understood. So that we, why, why our research strongly should signal there uh, are big opportunities, but we want to be very, very, very vocal also on the risk side. Michael, do you want to add to that? Or? I'll add uh, one other uh, interpretation of, of some of the folks who consider this to, to be, uh, you know, a threat. It can actually be a competitive threat, as I said before, right? There are a number of these uh, new techniques, uh, new materials, who will compete with existing, um, existing providers. And so again, if you're someone who's going to compete against cultured meat, if you're someone who's going to compete against the spider silk fabric, um, you know that that is a real threat. And so you'll need to to, to understand how how to uh, compete with it, or you know maybe M and A. And uh, you know again, there are all kinds of ways in which you can respond to those types of threats. Okay, so um, there's a lot of questions um, about the nitty gritty of. Once you've got the science, um, how do you scale it up? How do you commercialize it? One of the questions which is interesting is what enabling technologies do you see as the key for uh, rapid in innovation and scaling in bio? Um, Matthias, do you want to take that one first? Um, yeah, uh, I mean, I would refer back to something I started earlier, the role of AI, and actually as, an, as a very important tool actually to much better understand biology. But if I would summarize it, so one, AI would be on my list. I mean, as in, not for all applications, but for many which relate to actually the better understanding of, of biology and, and um, handling the data, as Michael said. A second one, I would say, actually, is the automation here. Biology, whoever from, from the audience was in the lab that knows biology is messy, yeah? I mean, in chemistry, we had the high throughput screening, very structured, I mean, very kind of as much more controlled experiments in a way. So biology is massive. Today, I mean, if you just look over the last 10 years, we are in a world where you can actually automate handling of cells. I, I mentioned the iPSC cells. So I would say the, the better strictly controlled experiments and the scaling up and I mean, towards the world of high throughput in biology. And that you see in many areas, be it on the cell side, in proteomics, and of course, next generation sequencing is a prime example for that in its own right. And then certainly I would say data collection. Now, on the non-human data, we of course don't have uh, privacy issues. Still, there's the question, how do we handle it? So we have a couple of companies that actually even photograph cells and scale that up brutally to create immense amounts of, of data to compare um, perturbated cells with, with healthy cells. Now, when we look to human data, we, of course, have privacy topics. And the question is, what is our framework where perhaps everyone like us, be it still healthy or the patients we eventually are during our life, that we can maybe donate data, that is the basis for these innovations. So, in short, AI, I would put on the list, data and data collection paradigms, I would put, put on the list, and automation, and it's certainly there. We have a couple of more areas in our report, but I will leave it here, John. Okay. Um, Michael, um, how about you take this one? Uh, this, by the way, is something that most excited me about this report. Um, how can the bio-revolution contribute to a green economic recovery? 
Well, as Matthias made reference to earlier, when we added up the potential, um, you know, reduction in greenhouse gas emissions, um, it was material. You know, say, you know, eight or nine percent of. Uh, now, it might take some time for that to happen. I'll give a couple examples of how this might be true. Uh, take the meat supply chain, for instance. Uh, as as many folks know, you know, some of the animals that are raised in order to uh, produce beef, uh, you know, cows that is, uh, or or meat in general. Um, you know, do produce a, a substantial amount of methane, which is actually a, a more potent greenhouse gas in terms of heat trapping uh, than carbon dioxide. Um, and so, you know, if, if some percentage of that meat production was changed to either plant-based or uh, lab-grown meat, it would greatly reduce the, the um, emissions of, of, of methane. Uh, from that production process. But then there are other ways in which, you know, creating other physical um, uh, goods, you know, whether it's plastics and polymers, whether it's concrete, whether it's uh, textiles, uh, you know, w which are based in, in some cases in, in petrochemicals. Uh, the other bio routes in many cases uh, can actually have a, have a lower uh, carbon or greenhouse gas emissions um, than the traditional ways of doing that. And so there are all of these other bio routes, um, you know, if done well, can actually reduce uh, the, over, uh, the overall amount of, of greenhouse gas emissions. And as I mentioned before, um, you know, there are some, uh, you know, I mentioned, you know, harvesting livers of sharks. Um, that's not uh, great for the ecosystem. Uh, and alternative methods of uh, creating those types of materials uh, are superior from, a, from a, um, an ecological perspective. Thanks very much. Um, I mean, obviously, COVID is, is what is on everybody's minds at the moment. And, and the last question talked about the recovery. Um, we hope we're going to get one at some point. Um, Matthias, um, do you want to say something about um, how the advances of the bio-revolution are already helping to frame um, the early response to this virus? Well, I mean, I would say... Um... You know, there are quite a few examples along the evolution of, of this crisis. I mean, A, I would just, uh, the timeline and the speed of progress. I mean, I think before this, the fastest way to, to get to a, a vaccine was four years. So I'm not claiming success here. This might get close, but I mean, I would hope it's faster than that. So don't expect from me a forecast, will we have a vaccine next year or not? Who knows? But uh, the progress even to get a new candidate into clinic, and there are now multiple candidates in the clinic, is unheard of. I think the second thing is actually the breadth of innovation approaches. And that's actually, I want to relate to a question I picked now myself here from the list, because there was somebody nicely asking, how can you be so confident? And that's, an, that's an excellent question, because we are not confident on individual projects, but we are confident that portfolio of technologies evolve. So what do I mean with that? I'm not confident that vaccine X will make it, but given the set of technologies and the breadth of, uh, of shots on goals almost, I'm pretty sure one or the other will come through. And that's also similar in our research where we said we are pretty confident on the confluence. We are pretty confident because we see, we see a visible pipeline and first projects making it to commercialization so we are not confident that each shot on goal will make it. So that, yes, there is a, is, is a risk involved here. Biology is never without risk, but that's also I mean, a way for me to explain confidence. Sorry, Janet, a little bit diverging back to the core question. I think also the early days of the pandemic are interesting and that's we document a little bit in a, in a sidebar in our report, the, the time to get to a structure of the virus, the time to get to Basically, the base information that allows therapeutic research was also faster than ever before. So we see how biological innovations make an impact here. We all hope, of course, it will progress further, I mean, over the next one, two years. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, here's an interesting question. Um, how do you prioritize um, different applications of the bio-revolution? Um, how, the, the prioritize the opportunities of, of, of the applications that we've outlined. Michael, do you want to have a go at that one? Yeah, I mean, first of all, uh, you know, I'll harken back to Matthias's point about confidence in that having a portfolio is actually helpful. 
Uh, and so understanding that, in fact, you know, instead of you know, just placing one bet, placing multiple bets uh, as you look at, at what you might want to do. Uh, but then in other ways, you know, this is in some ways a straightforward business problem. You know, understanding what the potential might be um, is, is going to be one dimension, right? So where, in fact, can you do the most good for your customers and therefore capture some value from it, um, you know, from a commercial standpoint? Um, again, a, a similar sort of thing if you're trying to save lives or, or um, you know, improve the quality of their lives. Where can you actually produce the most, most health care benefit? But then have an assessment about how hard it will be to take. How far away are you on the science? How far are you away in terms of being, being able to uh, produce at industrial scale, um, you know, either a material or a vaccine or a therapy or even a service? Uh, and so if you, if you put all those things together, you can create a portfolio that, you know, maximizes the potential return that you, society, others might get, um, while also increasing the, the uh, the probability that, in fact, you will be successful. Great. Um, another question, um, which is interesting, um, which countries are in the vanguard of this bio-revolution? Um, Matthias, do you want to take that one? Sure. That, that's, um, that's a very interesting question. I mean, because I think Countries get very interested in bio-based economies. But how we describe actually the bio-revolution is perhaps broader in its impact. Now, there are two forces globally. I mean, the U.S. and China investing heavily, coming from a very different legacy. I think, um, I mean, the U.S., with, with we all know, with a very strong research base, with a long history and uh, groundbreaking research in various aspects of the bio-revolution, um, I think China as a force investing heavily um, with, uh, and a country that has made a lot of progress on particular on bio-based, cell therapy-based approaches. So I would call out those two big countries, regions. Now, um, sitting here and talking to you today from Hamburg in Germany, I would bring Europe to the plate in terms of quality of the foundational research. But frankly, the numbers also show that, I mean, there is no really global business scaled out of bio-innovations out of Europe in the last 30 years. So that's perhaps a hidden force. But, I mean, those, those I would highlight at this moment of time. I think we've just got time possibly just for one more question, which is a, an important one. Um, many of the applications, particularly on the health side, will only be available to the very wealthy how will they be applied more equitably between and within countries? Great question. Um, Michael, do you want to try and answer that one? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, first of all, to the antecedent of the question, I would probably rephrase it that, you know, when first introduced, some of these biological innovations might be very expensive, uh, certainly very expensive to develop. Uh, and then how they will be priced is, is, is a different question. But what it calls into question is the potential that it, in fact, could um, you know at least continue, if not exacerbate, questions about inequality. If these treatments are very very expensive, perhaps only the very wealthy countries might be able to deploy them, or in some cases, very wealthy individuals be able to pay for them. And so there is a, a real question, both in terms of how they're priced and how they're distributed, which partially, uh, or in some cases substantially, uh, can be uh, uh, determined by public policy. And so trying to understand how, you know, we can both, you know, create these innovations, be able to make sure that we have the incentives as well as the ability to create these innovations and be able to distribute them. That's a hard, hard problem. Uh, and so one that, uh, you know, I don't think we have a, a pat answer for, um, but we do have to understand how to do this. The, these technologies do have the potential to exacerbate inequality both across countries as well as within them. I mean, let me I maybe, think we could... I mean, so, sorry, Janet, I mean, this yes, is maybe the, 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 the last question. I mean, let me just say nothing, not, not much to add, but let me also take this as an opportunity to say we wanted to trigger a dialogue also on the risks, on the, on the implications of, of this opportunity. So thank you also for asking the critical or challenging questions. And again, there's a lot we can't answer now, but uh, let us take it as an impetus for our further work. So thank you. Well, thank, thank you, thank you, Michael and Matthias, um, and thank you for our production um, team who helped us uh, uh, 
run this webinar in a relatively technically sophisticated and smooth way. Um, on behalf of um, the McKinsey Global Institute and McKinsey, um, we would love to thank you for joining us today. Mm -hmm.